Now you're welcome back to our rugby coverage. It is with thanks to Vodafone, sponsors of the Irish rugby team, team of us, everyone in. And John Robbie is our guest, I'm happy to say. He's a man who's taken the road less travelled in life. A Greystones boy, Welsh rugby loving granddad. Robbie made his name as a scrum half for Ireland. 40 years ago this summer, he was part of the Irish tour of South Africa. The year before that, in 1980, he had toured South Africa with the British and Irish Lions. And subsequent to 81, it's where he has made his home and forged a brilliantly successful broadcasting career, host of The Breakfast Show on 702 Radio for 17 years. Very happy to say John is with us. John Robbie, hello. Hello, how are you doing, Ian? You make me sound like I'm at my own funeral. <laughs> Sounds very impressive. The older I get, the better I was. No doubt, no doubt. How is retirement treating you, John, from radio at least? You retired a couple of years ago now. I retired three years ago and it's been fantastic. I've actually enjoyed uh, being very, very lazy. I do a, a few little things and I'm involved in a couple of, of, of charity things. And, you know, we've got kids and grandkids who are sadly for us living in England. We stay in touch with them. We've traveled a little bit. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying retirement. The fork in the road in your life really comes 40 years ago. I mean, where does 40 years go? I'm sure you're <laughs> wondering. It goes quickly. That 1981 <laughs> tour it's amazing, even just in the last couple of months. And I know you contributed to the documentary. It was on RTE radio and I knew it was controversial. The extent of the controversy probably hadn't fully uh, hit me in the sense that in advance, RTE are boycotting it. They won't cover it. The president of the country is against it. The church is against, or is against it. The Taoiseach, the government, Aer Lingus won't fly the team out. Extraordinary time. You by your own admission, carry a guilt with you around over this tour. Um, you say in, in one interview that uh, despite what I went on to achieve in your broadcasting career, which I do really want to talk to you about as well, but you said, despite what I went on to achieve, I consider it a stain that will never leave me. I live with the guilt of going on that tour and I will do so for the rest of my life. They're strong words. They're heavy emotions to carry around. Yeah, they certainly are. And, and, and I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, you know, I, I didn't kill anybody and, and I didn't commit any, any, any great crime and so on. But just inside, I think, I think I'm disappointed in myself. As someone who likes to think he's a reasonably decent sort of uh, guy, um, I, I look back now, I, I cannot believe that I took that decision. But when I go back and put myself into the, you know, 20 whatever it was year old kid who just dreamed of rugby, you know, it's, it, it, it's understandable that I put rugby ahead of everything. And in that documentary, I think Ginger McLaughlin said exactly the same. You know, growing up in Limerick, rugby was a religion. It was his chance. And, and looking back on it now, he said, I think it, it you know, I wouldn't have gone. And, and funnily enough, it, my great friend Hugo McNeil is the one who sort of says to me, you know, get over it, Johnny. You know, you've done a, a lot of good work in, in, in South Africa. I made a modest contribution here and, and uh, get over it. Britain and move on so that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to do now uh, Ian Joe sorry <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm sorry. sure I, can you remember all the controversy very well like not every 20 something year old is watching the news or reading the newspapers but were you very aware of just how high up the food chain right up to governmental level and beyond this had gone in advance of going out that summer yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, it, I mean, it split families down the middle. There's, there's no question about it. And and um, f f funnily enough, the number of people who've come to me since, you know, you know with renewed interest on, in the tour, with the, the Lions tour coming up, obviously this sort of old story has, has come up with the anniversary of the tour and so on. And, and, and since I've come forward and, and given my honest views, I mean, I can only be honest, uh, of my feelings about it now, so many people who, who who got in touch with me and said, you know, I I hated you at the time. You know, I really was so disappointed, etc. And I'm so glad that that this has finally come through. And congrats. I, I I think feelings have softened on both sides. You know, even even Tony Ward, for example, you know, admitting that he went on the the, the Lions tour had a fantastic time. And this is the, the strange thing, and from a rugby point of view, the, the tours were, were fabulous. We were treated like superstars. And, you know, you're not going to say you didn't enjoy it. And yet there's that, there's that feeling of, of guilt inside. And, mm. uh, yeah, it's, 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 I think now that, the, you know, you could say the coals are being raked over again. But I think there's been a softening of feelings because it's so far in the past. And, and maybe people like yourself can't believe what a, what a controversy it was. But believe me, it was front page news. No, I can understand. I can understand 
it was it was huge and this would have been five years after the Glen Eagles agreement and you know there was no ignorance over apartheid in the 1980s everybody was well aware what was going on so I can well believe it interestingly Ward says that being on the British and Irish Lions tour of 1980 and seeing what he saw there was what put him off returning in 81 you obviously didn't return with the same sense of the situation that he did do you remember having thoughts in 1980 that I don't like what's going on here at all I'm not coming back obviously not to enough ex an extent not to go but that seemed to change Ward's view on the situation yeah I, I think that 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 I definitely knew and in fact funnily enough there was a meeting held you know I think the 1980 Lions was probably the first rugby tour where there were there weren't just rugby journalists following it there were journalists from the newspapers who weren't really interested in the rugby and, and some of them uh, maybe from the tabloids were interested in stirring up a little bit of, of, of controversy. And I remember there was a meeting, there was an article written by one of the, the newspapers saying that the Lions are unhappy. And so we had a meeting, big meeting with the Lions and Sid Miller was there and said, you know, I've heard, heard people are unhappy. Is there anybody who would consider not coming again? And I put my hand up. I was the only one who put my hand up. And even that, because it leaked out, et cetera, caused a little bit of little bit of controversy. Now, in hindsight, in the same way as Willie John did in 74, I would guess Sid Miller asked the team at the beginning of the tour, if anyone's going to pull out, do it now. You know, we don't want people pulling out halfway through. But of course, I was a replacement on the tour and would have missed that instruction at the beginning. So even then, I mean, if I'd be totally honest, I knew the situation was wrong. The problem was that, that, that again, as the documentary said, you know, business was flourishing with South Africa. Uh, there were all sorts of other links with South Africa that were going on. Therefore, why is Little Old Rugby, which is doing its best to um, bring about multiracial teams, uh, not doing bad things, visiting townships, charities, uh, etc. Why is rugby being, being uh, hounded? So, of course, that was a, a, an argument that many people had, and, and I could have and probably did punt it. But mm. deep down inside, I think I knew, and, and I, again, I've said before that one day, you know, it would come back to haunt me, which is, which is now. And, but all I could do is be honest and say that, mm. you know, I was a young kid, rugby mad, etc. I knew it was wrong, but anything that I did in those days, rugby came first. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the way it was, which is bizarre considering it's an amateur sport. But in, in a funny sort of a way, maybe it was more of a passion because it was, it was amateur. I mean, the thought of, of going training rugby, like going to the office today, you know, I think would, would take the magic out of it for me. So like many old, old fogies say, you know, I'm glad I played in the era that I, that I did play. And I'm right in saying, haven't I, that such was the opposition that Aer Lingus were not interested in flying the team down. So it was a case of the team departing as individuals in their civvies, heading for London, <laughs> and then putting on the IRFU suits. That was how the team made their way down to South Africa. Extraordinary morning. Yeah, that it, was, it, was very interesting. It, it was very interesting because I, had, I was a late driver and I just got my driving license. And then we were told that, that three of us, I think it was Freddie McLennan, myself, and Philip Moore had to drive to Belfast and fly from Belfast to London. And they said, because you are some of the uh, most recognizable Lions uh, 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 players. And of course I took this as a huge compliment. My goodness me, I'm being asked to make this special trip. Mm. And I remember I offered to drive. And of course I just got my license. And I can remember Phil Bohr and Freddie sitting there terrified, but uh, uh, you know, not saying anything because my driving was so awful up to Belfast but we made it and made it over there and and uh, and yeah it was funny I, I mean I remember watching on the television I think there was a big protest planned at Dublin airport and we were sort of in our hotels in London watching this etc and, and not getting any pleasure from it I think sure. I think that there, there was no pleasure in, in defying it was no pleasure being the center of negative uh, sentiment but I think the feeling was look let's just get out of this let's get to South Africa and let's start the rugby yes and because I think at that age, if I'd made that decision and I was looking at the protests and I was listening to the Catholic Church come out against it and the president and the Taoiseach and everybody who's anybody, I would have crumbled. I would have been freaked sitting in that hotel room in London looking at what we were at the center of. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, you know, each, each to their own. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I can't really add anything more. I, 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 was, I, was, I felt very guilty because Kata Asmo 
of course, the late uh, Professor Kara Asmo was uh, a lecturer at Trinity College Dublin, my university. Mm. And I'd never met him. And funnily enough, I never came to, uh, I, I didn't meet him in South Africa for many, many years. And I'd started on the radio and I'd started, you know, becoming uh, moved from sport into current affairs and was making a little bit of a name as a, I suppose, a progressive uh, radio host and, and, and maybe somebody who's bringing about some form of, of change. And I remember we were down at the big arts festival in Grahamstown, which I suppose is the South African equivalent of, of the Edinburgh festival. And we were there having a few beers in the evening at, at some jazz club or something. And somebody said, Kada Asmal wants to meet you. You know, he's here, Kada wants to meet you. And I remember my heart sinking and thinking, oh my God, I'm going to get slaughtered by this man here. Mm. And instead, this, this Kada Asmal, we've had a few drinks on board, I must admit. He just threw his arms around me and said, John, we finally meet. Well done on everything you've done in South Africa. No mention from him mm. of, of, of the tour and rugby, et cetera. And I remember saying to him, and he said something like, look, you know, uh, times change. It's what you do now and in the yeah. future that, that happens. And that meant an awful lot to me. And since then, I've spoken to his son and, and uh, was very sad when he passed away. I'm right in saying as well, John, you quit your job to go on that tour and then when you arrive on tour, news of you quitting has reached South Africa and there's envelopes of cash knocking around and it's, you know, John <laughs> Robbie, you know, you're, you're almost a hero to these people for quitting your job uh, yeah, to come well, out and play. Yeah, to some, to some people it was like that. And, and uh, yes, I did accept money and it was very, very pleasant uh, to, to, to accept money. You know, you might say it was sort of blood money, but, but you know, we were amateurs in those days. And quitting the job with Guinnesses, I mean, I was a reluctant Guinness employee, you know, I, I, my life was rugby, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do, uh, other, than, other than play rugby, which was amateur. Uh, I was married with a, with a, a, young, a young child, and, and I, so my family was Guinnesses, my dad was a long time Guinness employee, my brother was there, and that's the way Guinness worked in those days, that you had Guinness family, so I sort of got a job in there, and, and basically hated it you know I basically hated it it wasn't what I wanted to do didn't turn me on I made some fabulous friends there and and so in a funny sort of a way losing the job was 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 no issue hmm. and and I remember then two people phoned me up uh, to ask about jobs one was the late Paddy Madigan and and one was Shawnee Fitzpatrick who has gone on to some controversy in in Ireland and Shawnee Fitzpatrick phoned me up and said John you know you've, you've lost your job can we chat about it uh, etc and and for all that the controversies that surrounded Shawnee Fitzpatrick I'll never forget that he you know when other people were talking about things he actually actually took a step but I was offered a job two jobs in South Africa and ended up taking one uh, very much to go for one year to better my rugby and here we are all these, year late, uh, these years later. Well, indeed. And I suppose that's where your life becomes incredibly unpredictable. So you go on the tour, as you said, you get a job offer. I think it's at a barbecue where you meet someone and that leads to the job. And it's a job <laughs> in... You know more about me <laughs> than I know more than I know about myself, John. Well, we'll see. We'll see. You get a job in sales. And at the same time, you're playing for Transvaal Provincial Rugby. And so occasionally you go on 702 Radio and they start to like the cut of your jib and you start doing some sport for... 702. I think very quickly you win the South African Sports Broadcaster of the Year award. So you took to radio instantaneously, really. Yeah, I, I absolutely loved it. And, and um, you know, I, I wasn't a drinker in those days. I've, I've made up for it uh, since. But, but um, you know, we used to go down to the pub to watch Match of the Day. And I, had a, I had an eclectic group of friends in Greystones and, and in Trinity and, and so on. And, you know, Bagging in the pub, arguing, you know, you'd argue one side and, and then take the other side of an argument, taking mm. the piss out of people, all that sort of thing was very, very much what you did. And I could, I could handle myself in an argument. And, and South African radio was very, very conservative in those days. You know, it had been, it had been censored, it had been uh, heavily controlled, etc. Everything was, very, was sort of like, I don't know, in some ways, the English radio stations were very like the BBC. Uh, going way, way back, you know, when people used to wear dicky bows to go on the radio, ridiculous as it seems, and have those sort of plummy accents. And here was this loud mouthed Irish guy who could argue with anybody and was 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 very um, irreverent in a way. Uh, and I, I made a bit of a made a bit of a splash. And, and the radio station I worked for then was uh, very much a sort of irreverent rock and roll station. 
and uh, it subsequently moved and became the, the best talk station and still is, I believe, in South Africa. So uh, I, I, I suppose in a way I was one of these funny little guys who appeared from nowhere mm. and no one quite knew what to make of me, but it seemed to be quite compelling what was coming out of my mouth and what I was getting out of other people's mouths. And, and yeah, as you say, 30 years on, on, on 702, 17, driving the, the morning show. Yes. And I'm very proud of it. Yes, yes, it's incredible, really. And so what year then did you go from the sales job and, and actually link up with 702 full time? I was still working for a company called NTC, who were very, 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 very good to me. Um, and and then what, what happened was the Cavaliers went over this this rebel New Zealand side. The New Zealand official yeah, tour yeah, yeah. was, was cancelled at the last minute in 85. And I would have played for the Springboks on that tour with Nas Buerta as my fly half. And a lot of the New Zealand players got fed up because they said, look, we wanted to play this series against South Africa. It was taken away. It was nothing to do with us. And they formed this, this, this rebel tour. And uh, I was I played in all three trials with Nas Porter in the A team and was basically in the, in the Springbok team and um, uh, for that 85 tour. Then the Cavaliers came along and I got injured. And one of the radio stations, the SABC radio stations, Alan Wilkins, who's a very well-known cricket commentator, commentator nowadays, Alan Wilkins was also doing rugby broadcasting. He did play for Cardiff many years ago. And he said, why don't you come and do the commentary with me? In those days, commentators called the game. There were no sort of experts sitting beside them. Mm. And uh, I, I did the game and it went well. And from that, 702 gave me the shout and said, why don't you... Uh, help with the morning uh, program, the morning drive, and do the sport on it. So I did that for a couple of years, doing, getting up at a ridiculous hour, doing the morning sport, then going for my job at national trading, and then training in rugby. So I basically had, and that was semi-professional in South mm. Africa in those days. It was never fully professional, but I doubled my salary with what I was making uh, in rugby. And of course, it was tax-free, which was, which was rather nice. I uh, hope the tax man isn't listening now. And, and so it, it was great, but I was basically doing three, three jobs at a time, which was very difficult. And, and you know, my, my, my wife, a hell of a, a debt for, for sort of looking after the family while that was going on. Mm. So you're living this very busy life. You're making this very successful move into broadcasting. That's happening across the 1980s. When did you go from John Robbie, the young man for whom rugby was the most important thing, and going on the two tours you know, took precedence over any kind of political views. When did the political awakening happen? When, can you remember, did you start speaking out against apartheid? How, why does that happen? And give us a sense of what that was like, because I'm sure your Afrikaner teammates didn't love it. <laughs> well, funnily enough, they, again, they were sort of fascinated. I well remember going to play uh, the Blue Bulls in Pretoria, and one of our guys' wife was expecting a baby, so instead of going on the team bus, I mean, it was, it was, you know, it was blazers and ties and hotels and going on the bus and so on. And he got special permission to drive in the car. His car was there in case that some news and he had to get away quickly. And I volunteered to go with him. And we had this discussion, a very, very uh, solid Afrikaans, a uh, lock forward, um, eight, eight, eight foot tall. And, and I remember we had this conversation and it, it got on to politics and it got on to life and it got on to this, that and the other. And, and I, I gave my views, you know, he gave his views and concerns. And I remember afterwards, uh, as we got out, he said, uh, hell, John, he said, you know more about this country than I do, which I took again as, as a huge compliment. But, but the guys I spoke to, I, I think, were, were, were quite interested in me. They probably thought I was a little bit naive because they believed that, you know, any 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 sort of um, takeover by the majority would result in a communist state. This was the sort of uh, um, propaganda that they'd been fed, uh, fed from from cradle to grave. But I never really had any problems. Uh, it, it was more when 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 things got fairly hairy because. I moved, our radio station moved almost overnight from being a irreverent uh, rock and roll station with a bit of sport that, that I did and into this talk station. And because I had experienced, I, I set up a program on a Saturday afternoon called Sports Talk, where we actually took calls from listeners, which was very rare mm -hmm. uh, in those days. And it got quite heated in a, in a normal way that you'd get on a, on a a radio talk back these days. I mean, it, at the time in South Africa was deemed to be very, very progressive. Right. And uh, I was also, I, I suppose I was always politically aware, but, but 
the whole feeling was that the country was coming to this, this point where either there was going to be a bloody racial civil war or there was going to be a negotiated settlement. And then when you know, there were talks held with the ANC and, and, and people went on delegations up to Lusaka and the, you know, the word came down that something was going to, going to happen. And, and 702 then was looking for people who could do talk radio. You know, they, they overnight suddenly gone from, from um, music to talk. They only had DJs. And here was this loudmouth guy who handled conversations, who seemed to know what was going on. And they gave me a trial, which, you know, 10 to midnight on the sort of graveyard shift, which ended up causing mayhem. I think I told some lady to shut up and this, you know, I mean, I broke every rule in the book. I was in the pub in Greystones talking to my mates. And, and then they, they gave me the job and I sensed that this, this was an opportunity. It was an opportunity for the country and it was an opportunity for me. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And, you know, going from sort of Guinness to my job in, in South Africa, which very much was secondary to rugby. Mm. Now I had something I could get passionate about. And I started my little program. I think it was the 26th of January. Had a week where we had conversations that had, that had never been heard on, on radio in South Africa. And then one week later, on the 2nd of February, 1990, F.W. the clerk stood up in Parliament and the world went bananas. He said, we're going to let out Mandela, we're going to unban the ANC, the PAC, the Communist Party. We are moving towards a democracy. And the whole place went bananas. And there was this little sort of radio slot in the evenings where people could air their, their, their views and the whole thing went bananas. I thought this was totally normal. I didn't think this was anything great. Had I known the effect of it, I would have asked a hell of a lot more money than I was getting at the at the time. But uh, but that was that was the start of it, uh, Joe. Right. Okay. So the show at that stage, turn of the nineties, was incredibly popular, incredibly influential, like a real kind of center point for debate and discussion. And absolutely. I and mean, bear in mind, it was a graveyard shift. But it was, and, and also after after uh, Mandela came out and the move towards the first election. Mandela came out in 1990. There was an, uh, a sort of a, an interim government, a temporary constitution, and then the first election took place in 1994. And South Africa was the center of the world. Every uh, uh, news agency had, had people in South Africa. It was the story. And of course, there was this funny little guy on the radio late at night and everyone sort of thought, oh gosh, this is a great way to look at it. So um, there was so much foreign interest and that led to, uh, I suppose, me then being moved down the station into more um, uh, better time slots, etc. cetera. And, and there was a lot of controversy at the time. There was a lot of violence in the country. There was a lot of uncertainty, et cetera. And, and suddenly this talk radio took off in a big way and, and I was very much a part of a part of that and and had gained this reputation and, and, and couldn't be put in a box you know right. this Irish guy who's white he's a rugby player but he doesn't sound like most white rugby players and had death threats and this and and so on and it was looking back on it it was incredible at the time it was it was um I suppose you know the adrenaline was flowing and yes. it was very very exciting but it was very much in the now and John, what was your so what was your core message to your listeners on the issue of apartheid and Mandela coming out and where the country had to go? If if you know, because I didn't hear you at the time. So what what yeah. were you what were you trying to put out there about where the country had to go at the time? The, the, the message was very simple. There's a there's coming there is coming a bloody revolution in this country unless we the country can grasp this opportunity, this window of opportunity that says. Is it possible to negotiate? Is it possible? We seem to have a government that is willing to negotiate a transfer of power to the people that they have oppressed for so many years without violence. Now, that to me sounds like, because it's going to happen anyway. And, and, and of course, the banks had pulled the plug. I mean, the, the, the sporting boycott got a lot of publicity and, and all sorts of other things. The academic boycott, the artistic boycott, they got a lot of publicity. But the real point was the banks pulled the plug. Okay. And, and the South African economy was in absolute shambles and it was going down the tubes. And F.W. de Klerk saw it. P.W. Uh, Buerta didn't grasp the nettle. He, he chickened out and F.W. grasped the nettle. So my message was, this is going to happen one way or the other. And my God, there's this little window of opportunity. Let's get to know each other. Let's negotiate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and that was very much my message. And I was also making it up as I went along. You know, I made every mistake in the book. When I look back now at some of the things that I said, 
to, to, to various people and the way I said it, because it was the way I would have done it down in the pub in Greystones and the Burnaby in Greystones, I'd have said, you're talking rubbish. You know, don't you shut, sh shut up. You can't say that. You're okay. talking rubbish. Let's go into this again. But given South Africans, uh, South Africa's radio past, this was deemed to be very, very uh, controversial. Right. OK, interesting. So you're some kind of mix of, I don't know what, Howard Stern meets <laughs> shock oh, no. jock meets controversial. No, no, no. Meets. I never, I never, <laughs> ever, uh, I never, ever contrived things. Okay. I never, ever put on a facade. I mean, Howard yeah. Stern, as we know now, was was acting half the time. Yeah. What you got on the radio was what 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 you got off the radio. OK. And and, 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 and that was what I think, even though my my broadcasting, you know, as I say, God, I made every mistake in the book. I mean, Fair really, enough. really did. But what you got was, was what you heard was what you got. And I think people realized, you know, this is real. This is real okay. now. And that's what made it compelling. Because I know that the police I was reading asked the apartheid killer Eugene de Kock, who in 1996, <laughs> by the way, was sentenced to 212 years in prison. That's so right. in the early 90s, the South African police obviously didn't like what you were about, and they asked him to assassinate you. And I think he might have, but for the fact that he was a listener. That's well, that's what he told me. I met him and it was it was very, very scary. And he said, look, I I didn't kill people I disagreed with. But there were a lot of things There was it came up in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Another guy called Paul Erasmus who was involved in the police that 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 because the because I was very critical of police brutality. Right. And and, and bear in mind, you had the, the police and you had the secret police and you had these 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 killing squads etc it was very very murky at, at, at the time but at one stage they were going to invite me the police out to a, on a patrol to show what wonderful people they were and they were going to stage an attack and i was going to get shot in the leg and i remember talking to this guy erasmus and i said so the police were going to shoot me in the leg because i was complaining about police brutality <laughs> And he said, yes, you know, and he said that went up to ministerial levels, wow. which was scary. And, 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 and some of the death threats that, that we got, which which I suppose I wouldn't say laughed them off, but but I never I never really took them that seriously because the expert said if someone sends you a death threat, that's just to frighten you, upset you. You know, the person who's going to kill you is just going to is just going to kill you. But the real the real people, the heroes were my wife, Jenny and my kids, because they took an awful lot of stick. Um, you know, at school, the kids, and they were only little, and my wife, phone calls and letters uh, and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it all it all seems so, so long ago now and, mm. and, and almost unbelievable. Yes. You had some very memorable interviews. Like, I know even it made news over here. I think it was maybe 20 odd years ago. You interviewed the Minister for Health. And at that stage, government weren't I think acknowledging that HIV led to AIDS, I think that's the general gist. And <laughs> I used the temerity to use the health minister's first name and she didn't think oh, much of that. Okay. And that became a huge deal. So you were at the center of these kind of big national moments. Yeah, a shitstorm, I would call it, you know. Yeah. And, and having been at the center of a shitstorm in Ireland over the rugby tour, I sort of thought, oh, oh no, not again. But mm. but it was it was it was bizarre. I mean, I I, I, I had these interviews because I had this little platform. I interviewed some of the, you know, the good and the great and some of the not so good and, and not so great. And, and my style was, I tried to make it very informal. I tried to make it like a chat, like, like we're, we're having that. And, and of course, I, I suppose that, that most of the ANC, the liberation forces, would have been in favor of what I was doing because they could say, well, here's this white guy. Maybe he's a useful idiot, but but at least he seems to be trying to move things along towards uh, a, a democratic uh, situation. He seems to be fair. What a what a what. Then this AIDS lunacy hit. Tabo and Becky, this very very intelligent man, had this blockage about HIV AIDS. It is not caused. AIDS is not caused by HIV. There is something wrong, and people are dying like flies uh, in, in in South Africa because because of this. And um, the minister, this, this uh, very tough little lady, shame she's passed away, Dr. Manto Shabalala Msemang, uh, I got her on the program. And, and uh, I called her by a first name, there was no problem. It, it, the, the issue, I mean, what happened was politics. There was, there was a report from the, the DA, the opposition, that said um, we received, our, our Western Cape office received this email 
probably a fax in those days, uh, from the Minister of Health saying AIDS comes from Mars, it comes from the aliens, the aliens have brought AIDS here, you know, Looney Tunes. And uh, they said, this is crazy. So I said, get the minister on the program, let's find out what's going on. And we, fine, everything went well. And then I asked her about this. And she said, well, John, you've, you've um, uh, what, what actually happened was anything to do with HIV AIDS, we send a bundle to all the different provinces so they can keep them up to date. And this was one of a hundred things that we sent. So it's a perfectly reasonable answer. And I sort of thought, well, let's get the DA on for trying to cause trouble, not telling the whole truth. She sent one little, one Looney Tune thing in a hundred, a bundle of a hundred. Why, why are you wasting our time? And then I re suddenly realized there's another five minutes left of the interview. So I said, um, why didn't you put, how's this for Looney Tunes on the top of this email to avoid any confusion surrounding AIDS? And she said, there is no confusion surrounding AIDS. I said, pardon? And this is when, you know, the government was saying, take um, sweet potatoes and lemon and garlic, and this is as good as, as antiretrovirals. So I said, oh, hang on a second, there is. Oh, no, there isn't. Yes, there is. And then I suddenly thought to myself, well, let's put her on the spot. Do you believe HIV causes AIDS? And she wouldn't answer. And she kept going on and saying, refer to this document. I said, do you believe, a bit like Jeremy Paxton with that famous interview where he asked that same question 13 times. And then she said, and by the way, you called me by my first name. I'm the minister, this, that, and the other. And it ended up going horribly wrong. And I put the phone down on her, the minister. And all hell broke loose. And the ANC wanted to be taken off the air and fired and this and that and the other. And it made headlines. And, and uh, yeah, it was, it was, I think, probably the most unprofessional interview I've ever heard in my life. The way I talk to a minister. You know, regardless of the individual, you talk to the, 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 the office. You have to respect yes. the office. And, and um, I've asked 702 to burn every copy of that interview. <laughs> but I'm very proud that I was the first person to publicly call out a government minister. And funnily enough, a week later, Kada Asmal, who was in uh, the cabinet, stood up and said, this is, this is, put his hand up and said, this is wrong. And I'd love to think just maybe my little, my little step uh, had, had something to do with it. But uh, mm. yeah, it was, it, was, it was tough times. And, and of course, the end result was, that South Africa now has the biggest uh, HIV, you know, anti-AIDS program uh, probably in the world. I know Mandela was never on your program. You did meet him, though. Tell us about that. Yeah. I met him several times. Yeah. And, and I mean, I famously, I, 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 my great claim to fame is that Bill Clinton and I were the only two people he told to shut up. <laughs> in, in public and, and afterwards he smiled and yeah he he wouldn't come on the program and um, his his because we were a regional station we were a regional station um the, the the anc publicity people always wanted him on national stations and we had a couple of shows that were um uh simulcast between johannesburg and and uh, cape town and my show wasn't because you, you know your morning show if there's a crash on the M1 it's a big big news story on a local radio station yeah. but if it's a national stadium a station it's not so we had our own morning show in Cape Town and then what really got me is one of the the, the simulcast shows Mandela came to 702 and they put him on that one and I was absolutely hmm. absolutely furious but uh, but I met him a number of times and and uh, you know what a man we won't see his like again no why did he tell you to shut up. <laughs> uh, so it's a long story we're involved in a in a in a, in a uh, dinner for the media and our little radio station was up in the corner and cheekily i sent a note and 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 he came and sat with us you know will the president come to us we're also part of the media and he came and sat for an hour and and um people were gobsmacked you know when you met mandela there, there, there was a religious presence about yes. him. you know a he was so huge his pictures don't give you know he was six foot three or something man he was a big big man and so suddenly you're sitting with the most famous man in the world and i've seen top business leaders tongue tied they couldn't speak to him and it was a bit like that when he sat down and i didn't waste the, the chance i said mr president can i ask you a question and he said oh yes 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 and i said uh uh, you know, why is it you'll meet with the, the people who locked you up, the, the architects of apartheid, you've met the mother of a vut, you've had tea with her, and you won't meet Chief Butelezi. Now, that was a very sensitive 
political issue between the IFP, uh, the Zulu sort of uh, traditional party and the ANC. And there'd been a lot of violence and Mandela, oh, he went and this and that. And I was suddenly like, I was interviewing and I remember once I had the finger out like this to Nelson Mandela. Hmm. And he said to me now, yo, shut up. And he smiled, he says, you are not on the radio now. You see, <laughs> and that was his great gift. He could be tough as anything, but like mm. my other great hero, Archbishop Tutu, uh, but he always had that humor that could soften things and, and, and charm people. And uh, yeah, so he told me to shut up. <laughs> wow. Uh, we're talking to John Robbie, if you just tuned in. John, across these 17 years, you're getting up at 2.15 a.m., did, does burnout come into it because you're not only getting up that early and then you're going on air, you're then following the news for the rest of the day because that's the gig, that's the job. So to do that for 17 years takes unbelievable work ethic, discipline. How did you manage 2.15 every morning? I would think that must take a toll on your health. Fear of failure. Fear of failure is the, is the answer, uh, undoubtedly. And, and also, I suppose what they call imposter syndrome. You know, this fear that you're actually going to be found out at some stage that someone is actually going to expose you as an idiot uh, on, on, on your radio program. Um, they sent me over seven or two in the early days to Australia to observe Alan Jones, who hosted the morning show on 2UE and 2GB for 40 years. And I went over there early and I saw how he prepared. The preparation level was unbelievable. And I realized that, that if you prepared well, that the actual show wasn't work. You know, it's, you, you, you were so well prepared. There was always something, if it was too serious, you could lighten it. If it was too light, you could make it serious. You could do this, that, and the other. So I had preparation and okay. I scripted a lot of the stuff, but did it in a way that no one realized that that's when, why, when they started bringing these cameras into studios so they could, you know, put things on different, different media platforms. I hated it because, yes. you know, the magic of radio is a lot of the preparation people can't hear and it all just sounds like it's it, it, it's off the cuff so I used to get up and I used to work for three hours flat before I went on air and I usually felt I was still under under prepared and and a fear of failure was the thing but it was very unhealthy I mean I look at photographs of of, of me then and I was drawn and I was yeah. pale and and if I sat down anywhere I used to fall asleep you know, it's only, <laughs> but now since I've retired, I've discovered I'm actually quite a lazy person, you know, <laughs> and, and I look back and, and wonder how, how I did it. But, but I'm very proud of that. And also, also, I think, uh, again, from Alan Jones, I think I set standards that other people on radio, certainly on our station, uh, started to copy as well. So in, in a funny sort of a way, uh, I changed the way people looked at looked at radio. And that's something I'm very proud of as well. And, and when I retired, they gave me a lifetime achievement award. You know, they have these annual radio awards, but they gave me the sort of the big award, which was which was very special indeed. Hey, not bad from for the kid from Greystones, is it? You know, who pitches up there with a sales job. Uh, to, to the present. Well, I'm selling my, I'm selling myself pretty well here, aren't I? Yes, uh, you're doing hell. You can see the sales training. So again, time's getting away from us, and I knew that would be the case. There's such a stark backdrop at the moment to this Lions tour, the COVID situation, and now promptly followed by the riots. We're speaking on Thursday, so at this stage, you know, we've just had that game last night between South Africa mm -hmm. and the Lions, and at last count I saw anyway, there were 72 dead in the protests and 1,300 arrests, and there's losing, and at the moment it's limited to two provinces, a response initially, John, to Jacob Zuma's imprisonment, but I suspect as well, increasingly some kind of reaction to crippling poverty exacerbated by the pandemic. There's 32% unemployment. Uh, things feel very, very dark over there at the moment. A very tough time for the country. Are things broadly going in the wrong direction, right direction? Where is South Africa in your view? Um, I, South Africa is, is a very good news story because again, it could have been Syria. It could have been, you know, uh, any any a, a country where there's been a massive c civil war, Libya, it isn't like that. But but it's been very disappointing. Um, uh, after after Mandela, the wonderful years with Mandela uh, and Becky, with the exception of 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 AIDS and a couple of other uh, dodgy things that he got into. I mean, the economy. He rode the commodities uh, boom. The country was doing very very well. There was it it, it was on the right way. Okay. Uh, and then Zuma came in, who was an absolute crook. I mean, just the most horrible man that, that, that ever lived. And, and sadly, because he'd been a bit of a hero in the days of struggle, although 
was obviously quite a tainted, you know, he had certain, certain issues uh, about his life, which are only coming out now. And he basically set out and, and robbed the, the state, you know, state capture, hollowed out the institutions that are there to, to as checks and balance against excesses of, of, of government. And of course, people were, were, were scared to cross him because he simply got rid of them. Uh, he brought in cronies, he put dreadful people in. And, and the end result was, was uh, a lot of people made an awful lot of money, but the economy started to fail. People were out of work, etc. And he plays, I mean, he's an amazing man. He, he plays the victim extremely well. That's how he got into power. He, he was fired as, as deputy president. I think Becky put him in thinking here's someone who'll be no threat, you know, as just a, a figurehead. And uh, he, he, he got fired for, for various things and then played the victim. And a lot of his support who tend to be very rural, very traditional, perhaps less educated people, uh, they feel this, this, this narrative has been played and, and he then, the Stalingrad, offense, uh, Stalingrad defense, which means using state money for lawyers to just go for years and years and years, mm. finally has come to an end. And the crooks that are surround him that also are gonna to go to jail, they've provided this, this spark, but, but people have been angry for years and years and years. They've seen politicians grow fat and rich. They've seen dodgy business people grow fat and rich. And meanwhile, the economy has suffered. You mentioned 35% unemployment in the age group 18 to 30, it's 74%. And there's an old adage, you know, if you see teenagers, unemployed young people on street corners, then your country is in, is in trouble. And uh, the economy was in big trouble long before COVID came in and, and people are angry. And I think that some of Zuma's supporters, there are suggestions now that that some of the ex-intelligence people actually fueled this, this demonstration in order to try and bring about a political solution, maybe Zuma to get some form of pardon to avoid this, this stuff. But once you light the fire, angry people have come out and there's been some shocking, shocking scenes. I think, I think that, that it's been in a relatively small number of places, uh, but the damage has been very, very serious. And we've got you know 25,000 troops out on the streets now, which is, something we hoped we wouldn't see after the days of apartheid. So, so I think very, very disappointing at the moment, but the president has got to act, he's got to be decisive now, and, and hopefully we'll, things, we'll see things settle down. Yes, no, hopefully. So our time is coming to a close. The Lions Tour hopefully will go well and things will settle down and people can enjoy the rugby and hopefully the COVID situation improves. So how then do you reflect on these very strange 40 plus years, this tour, which you've said still kind of catches you and you have a certain <laughs> guilt over and is there and will always be there, you say. And yet it led to this incredible fork in the road and you took this, you know, path, which has turned out in a kind of wonderful way. It seems like you've had an amazing career and amazing life mm. and you feel like you've contributed in, in some way to the discussion and, 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 you know, atoned, I think, to use your in words a modest, so. in, a, in a modest, in a modest way, way. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's not, not let's not let's overstate not it. Sure, but in your own small yeah. way, in your own small way. Yeah. I mean, we're talking yeah. about your experience here, not not in a, in a big national sense. So, in your own head, then, how do you kind of uh, when you mix it all together? You're kind of at peace with the whole thing, or or, or, or what? Uh, are your, how do you fate, sum it up? Fate, fate. It was fate. There's no question. I mean, I I, I, I was getting a becoming a bit of a pain with all this mea culpa thing and people are getting fed up with it and and um it was it was an uncle of jenny's my wife uh, a guy called uh, alan stanley who lives in carla and and he was one of the people who i only discovered had been very anti my decision when this article in the telegraph i think it was came out where i i gave my current views and he got in touch with me and said well done you know well done and, and then i had a bit of correspondence with him and, and again he sort of said look you know sometimes things happen it's just, it's just fate. And I look back at, at going to South Africa, losing my job, suddenly deciding to go and, and the, the, the things that fell into place that led me to go there, the, the move to the radio, etc. And in a funny sort of a way, it's almost as though the decisions were made for me. I don't, I don't remember sitting down and really agonizing, even the, the, the decision to go to uh, South Africa with Ireland in, in 1981, even though it was, there was a lot of controversy and angst and so on, looking back at it, I was, rugby was always going to win. Rugby was always going to win in the end. I was going to go on the tour. And all those other decisions, 
there should have been far more thought gone into them. It was almost as though things just happened right, right the way through. And it was Alan who, who said to me, look, sometimes a fate, you just got to think it was meant to happen. And, and uh, you know, without getting silly about it, I, that's, that's, that's in my head what I feel comfortable with at the moment, Joe. Okay, well, listen, we wish you a continued busy and happy retirement. Enjoy the three tests. Thank I mean, you. hopefully we'll get good games. I mean, based on what we saw last night, it should be tasty enough. Yeah, funnily enough, it's very interesting because people say, who are you up for? And I'm a South African citizen now. and I'm South African. And, and when Ireland play South Africa, I'm up for South Africa. You know, I'm, I'm a South African fan now because I didn't have a great Irish career. You know, just, I don't have great, great, uh, lovely family, uh, friends I made and so on. But my actual rugby career was a bit disastrous. But the line, with the exception of the tour in 1976 to New Zealand, which was which was fantastic. But but so Ireland, I'm I'm a South African when when, when right. we play Ireland. But with the Lions, I didn't know because the highlight of my rugby was with the Lions, and I'm hugely proud of it. Uh, but when I watched the game last night, I was up for the South African A team. You know, <laughs> the Lions having destroyed three very weak sides up till now, and then the South Africans climbed into them, and I thought. Yeah, this is the team that won the World Cup. So I think that's that's everybody now has suddenly thought, hang on a second, this is going to be a, a great test series. And I certainly hope it is. Well, John Robbie, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks so much. Great honor to be here. Thanks very much indeed. All the best now.